Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Screen Junkies Movie Fights, powered by the Popcorn Talk Network. Now your host, Andy Signor. Greetings, Screen Junkies. Welcome to another episode of Movie Fights. Uh, this is an exciting one because the Oscars were just announced for the 80th, uh, 87th Academy Awards, and we're going to hear break down some of the nominees. Uh, we're also going to talk about uh, the Avatar sequels. Do we need them? Uh, best biopic. Uh, so much fun stuff this week that I'm very excited to bring you. Uh, so please stay tuned. And as always, last round is always a tease for this week's Honest Trailer. Uh, before I start, I want to always thank our friends at Popcorn Talk Network for housing us here. Uh, Maria Menudo's the Schmoes, and we have one of them here today. Uh, so grateful to be in this fun place to do this awesome show for you. So please check them out. Uh, Popcorn Talk uh, YouTube channel. YouTube.com slash Popcorn Talk uh, Network. Um, and so, also, as you know, we're on iTunes. If you're watching on YouTube, uh, YouTube, please uh, check us out there. And if you're listening on iTunes, come check us out on YouTube at Screen Junkies. Um, and uh, as always, we have so many fights. I just want to last uh, bookkeeping here. Bottom right corner, if you're watching online, you can click through the fights. If something's not exciting you, just go to the next one. Don't just leave. We have so many fun topics to talk talk about. And this week, who's going to talk about them? Well, we got three, I think, three champions here today, correct? Mm-hmm. First up, producer of Movie Fights, It's uh, and you've seen him on Red and Link's Good Morning, Mythical Morning. A lot of you are like, is that? It is him. It's Jason Inman. <laughs> yes. I'm usually a lot taller than this. I took the shortest chair for today. so I made sure I had a, a taller yep. seat than you. <laughs> uh, comedian, you know him. You love him from the schmoes. No, it's Mark Ellis. Thank you very much. We actually gave you the incredible sinking chair. There's there's one magic yep. one that rotates around uh, the studio, so that's mythical it. mythical chair. I'm it's, honored. Oh, the mythical chair. It's like chair. a unicorn, except it's not as cool. I, yeah. I want to thank all the Screen Junkies fans, too, because a lot of them have come over to the Schmoes No YouTube channel and subscribed there. If you haven't done it yet, check us out on YouTube. Schmoes No, subscribe. Love you guys. Thank you so much. Subtle plug. No, for real. <laughs> please, please, please. I just, I kid. Please go support the Schmoes No <laughs> channel. We love them, and that's why we have them on, because we want you to check them out, and they do. They know as much awesome stuff as we do, so why wouldn't you? Next to him, oh my god, it's the returning champion? How many is it now, Dan? Uh, 4-0, oh, I think. Wow. Oh my god. 4-0, yeah. oh, Mr. Dan Merle. I'm here, and I'm ready to pout my way to another victory. So Dan doesn't know something here today. Nope. We are instigating a new rule on this show, and we're surprising Dan. We're going to try our best to bring back the returning champion every round, but but more important than that... Uh-oh. I like that sound effect. Yep. What is this? It's good. Dan Merle has oh now received God. the title belt! Wow! Oh my God, yes. Dick, can we pass this along oh to our man. to our champion? I don't want to give it up. Exactly. Look at that! And it, <laughs> wow. it lights up if you shake it. It lights up if I shake it? <laughs> you see it? it? Oh, yeah, look at that. <laughs> Dan, we are happy oh. to present to you, you are currently the Movie Fights champion. Oh, I feel like, I feel like Apollo Creed. <laughs> <laughs> Where's James Brown? James Brown. <laughs> so to make this year interesting, what we're going right. to do, last year's scores have been tabulated. We're going to keep them on the record. <laughs> but we're starting over this year. The people who win the most, uh, you know, we're going to tabulate them. We're going to bring them back. Now, what this also means is, Dan, you have a belt on the line. I do. And we were hoping today you might want to make another title bout and put the belt on the line for today's show. Are you down? Wait, so <laughs> I could be I'm Clever confused. Lang. I caught up money before. I'll so call Dan. Wait, is the belt Each, is the belt not always on the line? The belt is always going to be in the line for whoever takes it in a title bout. So would you like to make this a title bout to make today interesting, Dan? Please say yes. Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so the belt's on the line today. What's which the is... point of having a belt if you're not willing to lose it? <laughs> I, that well, sounds like a Rocky quote. Not to get too <laughs> hung up. I want to get to the show, but sometimes we have guests that can't come back. There's there's reasons why we can't always guarantee the winner to come back but what we can guarantee is if they bring the belt on and they call it a title bout this is going to become a title bout so dan are we making this a title bout it's a title bout baby so the belt is on the line the belt's on the line oh Ooh. wow i'll this tell you this right now interesting if i leave the studio with the belt today i'm never coming back on this show <laughs> i'm retiring from screen junkies movie fights uh, so anyway, fantastic work of the belt. I think did Paris Hilton. Yeah, who made this? Did Paris, I think I. I did you say Paris Hilton made the belt? Hilton. Wow. Paris, Paris, Hilton. Paris Hilton. Wow. I gotta verify. I'll thank you again. We I'm locked her in a room last Michael night. Michael Randy helped us put that together. And I haven't even seen it in person. I saw That's photos. Incredible. It yep. looks really, really cool. Yeah. I'm very amazing. jealous. It looks like uh, something magical that lights up at night, like Night of the Museum kind of thing. It does. Like an Indian in the cupboard. Can we get a good shot of this in a camera? Which can you hold it up one more time? There we go. Hold it up in your camera. There it is. Look at that. This belt is cool. It's on the line this made things way more interesting today uh, and to help us because both of our traditional fact checkers are here on the panel we actually are bringing in another feature it's the fan cam what on the fan cam is miss movies hey. hello miss movies hi 
Thanks Miss, for having me. Miss Movies is a podcast uh, genius of herself. She's done <laughs> right. uh, the, the Film Vault, the Miss Movies Minute, and she's also a f- super fan of us on Twitter, and she's always said, I'd love to do this, and then I, I checked her out. I was like, she's legit. She's mm-hmm. a legit mm-hmm. podcaster, a film yeah. lover, and so we're instigating the fan cam today for our fact checker, Miss Movies. Welcome. Hey, thanks. I'm and the I, next Sarah Koenig, guys. I have to say, oh. Dan and Jason, <laughs> she brought us treats. I know. Yeah. She so, made Reese's peanut butter I'm, fudge. She's which starting off with a between good... Between the treats and maybe loosen the belt, I could be in the office next Friday. <laughs> <laughs> you might leave here without a belt, but with diabetes. That exactly. could happen. So this is a very exciting round today. And, of course, we're, we're going to hit a lot of the Oscar topics. Uh, I've, I think I've explained the rules of the belt. Everyone understands, yes? Yes. If that is the case, let's jump right to the show. Uh, and uh, in the great words of Aragorn... This day we fight! Right. Oh, I'm trying some new ones. Yeah, yeah I like that. All right. Well, let's vote might, in the comments. Which one's best over there? Is that edge Edge over that one, maybe? I don't know. <laughs> maybe. Yeah. All right. It's an have? inspirational one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Round one. The 2015 Oscar nominations came out on Thursday. Uh, Birdman Grand Budapest led the nominations with nine each. Uh, but Owen Cost on Twitter asked us for fight number one. <laughs> worst 2015 Oscar snub. There were a few. There's a couple obvious ones. There's a couple more. I mean... There were definitely more than one, uh, and I want to hear each of you take. So, Jason, we're starting with you. Who was the biggest snub this year? Uh, my biggest snub is Jake Gyllenhaal for Best Actor in Nightcrawler because he was far and away the best performance I saw this year because it was the first time I didn't see Jake Gyllenhaal in any of the roles he's ever done. I saw a completely formed character, and I also think that Nightcrawler being snubbed along with him is one of the biggest shames of this Oscar because if you look at that movie... It is the taxi driver of 2014. It is the film that 15 years from now, people will be like, what was LA in 2014 like? Oh, Nightcrawler. It really was a little capsule of 2014 and the perfect way to look back at this year in future years. Interesting take, Mark. I have to go with a category that was far less competitive than Best Actor, and that is Best Animated Film of the Year. There weren't a lot of great animated movies this year, but the Lego movie came out in 2014 and somehow was not nominated. There was an audible gasp yesterday morning when they announced the nominees without having the Lego movie in there. There's three movies that people have heard of, two that no one had heard of, and somehow everything wasn't awesome yesterday. That is a crime against humanity and all the children of the world that the Lego movie was not nominated for the best animated feature. Damn. Yeah, well, I think the, the, there are multiple snubbies. As anyone who's not male or white, this was the most, <laughs> this is the least diverse, this is the least diverse group of nominees uh, literally this century. And I, it speaks to a problem that the Academy has, which is that if you look at the demographics, the Academy is overwhelmingly two things, uh, white and old, really old. And the Academy has a problem where they don't recognize diversity. They're not socially conscious until people tell them they have to be. Uh, and that's not to take away, like when Catherine Bigelow won Best Director, it's not to take away from 12 Years a Slave last year, but both of those wins were large part the media saying, like, this is the time for a female director to win. This is the time, you know, with 12 Years a Slave, it was, uh, if the Oscars don't recognize it, it says a lot about race in America, and they kind of perk up and go, okay, well, then we should, yeah, okay, we should broaden our horizons here. Fine. But they have a big <laughs> problem with the Academy, which is that when there's not a quote-unquote socially conscious move to make, they're very homogenous. They go with what they know, which is old white people. That's why Clint Eastwood get so many nominations every year and uh, it's really uh, an overwhelming problem with the Academy in general and there were really some great people like uh, David Oyelowo for Selma and Ava DuVernay who directed that movie Gillian Flynn who wasn't nominated for Gone Girl that did not get recognized those would not have been token nominations those were incredibly incredibly amazing jobs that were not recognized by the Academy and all those Academy voters are way too old to have grown up playing with Legos. They played exactly. with Lincoln Logs, or they had to go outside and build crap themselves, and so they didn't appreciate the greatness of the Lego movie, which appealed to multiple generations. Parents and children but, could both watch the Lego movie. Do we have a problem that the Lego movie, movie is basically the world's longest commercial? No. Just because it has Legos in it, it's a great ad for Legos, it's but it can also product. be... It's a huge product placement, it, though. It might be the best product placement that of movie, all time. But still. It's no Taco Bell in Demolition Man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but look, it, the fact that it's a product placement movie doesn't bother me because it was so fun and engaging. And, and, and unlike what you guys are talking about, because if you look at the best picture or the best actor race, there were a lot of great performances, and you could have put Jake Gyllenhaal or David Oyelowo in that last spot. It was really, really tough. The best animated feature film, it was not as competitive. 
it, it, those movies were not the quality I, I would that disagree. the Lego movie was. I would disagree that the best actor uh, category was as competitive because they slipped a couple, like like Benedict Cumberbatch in Intimidation Game, great movie, great performance, but in that film, he basically just played Benedict Cumberbatch. Like, really, in everything we've, we've he seen was before. Sure I thought he was, he was, I thought he was great. He was, he was good, but like compare it to Jake Gyllenhaal, who like completely, that was not Jake Gyllenhaal. No. That was the creepiest <laughs> mother we've ever seen on screen next to, again, Robert uh, Robert De Niro in Taxi Driver. Like, he was so creepy. He was so fully formed. He had such a weird way of thinking about the world. And even, uh, this is something that a lot of actors don't do that he did in that form. It, it's, it's, it's intonation, his tempo. He completely changed the way he spoke uh, uh, from normal Jake Gyllenhaal. And that is... A, that, that is a masterful performance every time you change the way you speak as an actor. I thought it was yeah. fantastic to watch, but I think if you counted out the ballots and you saw who got left off of Best Actor, I think David Oyola would be in the number six mm. spot and then Jake Gyllenhaal would be in the number seven spot. There's no Bless way me. that there was another animated film that was going to be number six before the Lego movie, and it honestly should have been number one because even the popular ones like Big Hero 6 and How to Train Your Dragon 2, they were both great movies, but none of them took over the world like the Lego movie did. It deserved to be recognized by the Academy. But both of these snubs, I think, are symptomatic of the bigger ver problem with the Academy, which is that they're out of touch. <laughs> I can see why they didn't, I, like, I thought Jake Gyllenhaal absolutely should have mm -hmm. been in the Best Actor category. I think the reason he wasn't nominated was because the old people the old that people. make up the majority of the Academy saw that movie and went, I didn't like him. I didn't like him. That, <laughs> but what it, happened is, to him? You didn't get punished. My son it's, owns a camera. Yeah. Is the old people, or, or sort of the quote-unquote, as it's been told on the internet, the whitewashing, isn't that symptomatic of all of Hollywood and not just the Oscars? Not necessarily. I mean... Uh, as, as horrible as this sounds to say, the Golden Globes actually do a pretty good job of nominating <laughs> a diverse field of, of, of people. Whether the international in. press. Whether they, exactly, the Hollywood foreign press. It, the fact of the matter is, and I think that the Lego movie suffered because the people that vote for that category saw live action and went, well, that's not an animated movie. There's people in it. Like, I think uh, what, the, no. what the Academy needs to do is get back in touch. Most of these people haven't worked in 20, 30 years. They need to restrict the, they need to restrict the membership of the Academy to people that have worked in the last five years and people that have won Oscars. That's it, because they are getting further and further and further out of touch with the mainstream, and it's really starting to show, and there are some really talented people that are getting overlooked. Because I think according to Dan, the Academy saw the Lego movie, they wanted to nominate it, then Lando Calrissian showed up, they're like, well, we can't have a black guy in a movie we're going to nominate, no. so we got to get that out of there. I think it. the point Will you're Ferrell all saying is Jake Gyllenhaal like... was the worst snub, right? Yeah. <laughs> no. Well, I, I, there was a, that was a great uh, fight there, and I don't want to call it right here. I, I'm going to throw one thought out and see how you guys reply. Sure. Uh, my challenge, where because I want to stay, I want to judge and be in, uh, you know, impartial, but I want to mm -hmm. say my thoughts so you guys can try and beat <laughs> me, won't beat that thought one more time. Aren't they always out of touch? So is that traditionally a snub? Because that's every year, pretty much, unless there's some big socially conscious movie, like you said. No, it's still a they snub, They never though. really do it, whereas these two films do feel specifically more snubs, where it's like you're just calling out something they always do, which I feel like it's exactly, very rarely a year. Sometimes there's one they cannot deny. My point being, do we really think Selma and Gillian, Gillian Flynn were bigger snubs than... Jake Gyllenhaal or Lego Movie. That's what I'm just trying to understand the argument, and I, you guys defend if that's not the case. Well, I I'll think say, so, yeah. I'll say this. I think that the reason why the Academy made a Best Animated Feature category is because they didn't want to have kids that are more, or films that are more geared towards children competing against their best pictures. And so in, in that vein, the fact that the Lego Movie was not considered, and it was by <laughs> far the most entertaining movie for kids and adults to come out this year, is ridiculous to me. There's snubs, like what Gyllenhaal was, and then there's all-time misses, like when when uh, Shakespeare in Love beat Saving Private Ryan. That's what this is. It's because I, it's almost like they just forgot that the Lego movie came out in 2014. It's ridiculous. I would say Gyllenhaal is, 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 a, is a big snub because if you take Gyllenhaal out of Nightcrawler, Nightcrawler doesn't work. Without his performance, that movie does not work. Can you say that about any of the of the best that like, like Michael Keaton uh, carried true. you know helped carry Birdman? He helped carry Birdman, but it was more of an ensemble cast. Nightcrawler is is, is about that character so much more than anything else. It's about him. Uh, you can take Michael Keaton out of Birdman. You could probably cast somebody else in there. I love Michael Keaton. Val Kilmer, one. George Clooney, sure, any Christian, of the Batman, Bale. Christian Bale, <laughs> Adam um, West. There's still Edward Norton. There's still Emma Stone. Uh, uh, Selma is the same thing. Uh, imitation Game. Take out Benedict Cumberbatch. Nobody notices. I mean, we'll just put in any. Who else any in that category movie. wasn't? I mean, do you think he was better than anybody else in that category? Eddie Redmayne also as Stephen Hawking was pretty good. I mean, I think you could have put Gary but, Busey but, but in Benedict, that crawler. That would have been Benedict Cumberbatch also played that same role like three or four years ago, yeah. and, and, and he played the ex Stephen Hawking exactly the same, and I think did it a lot better. Really? Uh, I've, yeah. I've seen it. He, yeah. went, he went full Hawking. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's true. 
That's Robert, true. Uh, uh, I, I, Jill Hall. I don't know if he would say the best is because I can't remember all five off the top of my head. But like Jill Hall is Cooper Keaton. Cooper Keaton. He's um, Jill Hall's in the top fact three. Fact checker, help us out. <laughs> Jill Hall's in the top three. Steve Carell. Steve Carell. Uh, yes, better. No. See, I think yeah. I think you could look at best actor and you could say Joan Hall is maybe the third best performance or the eighth best performance, but there's no way you could watch the Lego movie and say that wasn't one of the best five animated films of the year. And what and I guess you could say the same thing about Joan Hall, I think. Well, this your question five. was like, are these really snubs? Of course they're snubs. I mean, you had a chance to nominate for the first time ever the first female African American director in the history of the Academy Awards. So to, to not do that, I think is absolutely a snub. And I, you know, I think that they get caught up in tradition where to nominate Steve Carell because he put on a nose and talked kind of funny and then to, to, to ignore uh, David Yellow, who was at, I mean he was amazing in Selma I think that's a snub because you just keep going back to like they have this idea of who uh, should be nominated and they can't break out of that and, and it's it gets really frustrating because you just get the same old oh Bradley Cooper for the fourth time in three years is nominated for an Oscar all right. Well, this was the fact you guys all made valid points. My here's where I'm standing. I, Bradley Cooper and what you just said there at the end actually swayed me a certain way because I actually think Bradley Cooper was getting snubbed from every award and his role in that movie was hands down his best performance he's done yet. Just like physically, voice wise, it was the first time, like you said with even Jonah, that I've seen Cooper play something else than he's always done. So I actually thought that was them paying attention more than they did. And my other problem is like we shouldn't just give uh, the director of Selma the award because she's uh, you know the first African American female. That's not what I'm saying. But but you sort of did. I mean, I get it. But you sort of did. And it's like we had the chance to do that. We should but was it the best directed movie? That's the question. And there's a lot of controversy on Selma as to whether it really was the best movie. So that's where I'm discounting sort of that place. And then between you two, I think your point that you said there were not and there's no one there's like hardly any competition that even justifies why Lego movies not in those five whereas I think with Gyllenhaal while I agree with a lot of the things you said mm -hmm. amazing performance aside from probably Benedict it was, a, <laughs> it was a good year of actors there's a lot of competition there whereas with the animated movie I don't think there was any competition and Lego movies should have been nominated whether it won or not so Mark gets the points Home, home crowd rap. Yeah. <laughs> but that was a great round, guys. I love how we started off. And, and yeah, Joan Hall was one of my favorite performances of the year, too. So that's, he was fantastic. You know. Lego Movie was my first choice for this. <laughs> Let's talk. Let's talk. <laughs> I lost the coin toss. Uh, round two. Uh, Alex Pilpot on Twitter asked us, our Oscar thoughts, which film should win Best Picture? Uh... There's a lot of them. What, eight, right? Eight this year instead mm -hmm. of ten. Um, uh, let's start with you, Mark. What was your favorite? I mean, let's be clear. We're, we, I guess I should have set this up. This is the one we think will win. Should, or no, should, should win. win. Should the one win. that we like the best, not mm -hmm. what's assu assumingly the Oscars are going to win. Out of the right. films that are nominated, so unfortunately I win. can't argue for Godzilla. But I will <laughs> take Birdman, because I think Birdman was such a different kind of movie that I'd never experienced before. The same reason why I thought Gravity should have won last year is because when you were in that theater, you felt something you've never felt watching a film before. That incredible scene that everybody gushes over in Goodfellas when they follow them through the kitchen. Oh, what a cool long shot. That's what this entire movie felt like, and it took you on such a ride, both through this play and through this guy's psyche, played by Michael Keaton. I've never seen a film like that, and so I think that that is the best picture of the year. Dan? Uh, mine's Boyhood. I think it's, uh, you know, Jason, when he was discussing Nightcrawler, said that uh, when people look back at 2014, it's, it's a time capsule of Los Angeles. Boyhood is a time capsule of an entire era. It's a time capsule of 12 years of this kid growing up. I, I, it's, you know, I mean, it gets points for just being an audacious experiment to, to, to jump out and say, I'm going to do this and it's going to take 12 years. You know, it, it would have gotten my respect if it had been that a failed experiment that took 12 years, but the fact that it turned out so incredibly well that it really is going to stand. 20 years from now, I think people are going to be talking about this movie, and it's not going to date it. It's not going to be dated because it's a it encapsulates so much. It's such a unique movie. So many things went right. I mean, you know, you cast Ethan Hawke and Patricia Arquette, of course, you're going to get great performances, but, you know, to get Eller Coltrane and to cast him when he's six. And, you know, I know a lot of people don't like his character toward the later part of the movie, but I, I did because he's a stupid teenager, which is what you are when you're 18 years old. <laughs> uh, and I think that it's an incredible piece of movie making, and I think it, it should and will win the best picture. Jason? Uh, I'm going with uh, Grand Budapest Hotel because <laughs> it is Wes Anderson's film that transcends his own idiosyncratic uh, I didn't say that word wrong. Syncratic, I think. There you, you were go. Like two Thank you. consonants away. Yes. Uh, uh, his style. It, it, it is the classic 
timeless story of a lobby boy who eventually uh, takes over the hotel that he started working at. It has some beautiful symmetry. It has this amazing thing where he changes the aspect ratio of the film depending on the time period it's set. That is also another technical achievement. But also it's because Wes Anderson um, and the Oscars also tend to view careers. They don't tend to view single movies. And uh, there's a great director out there that never won an Oscar, and that's Alfred Hitchcock. And I think I don't want Wes Anderson to be an Alfred Hitchcock. He definitely deserves an Oscar. I think Grand Budapest Hotel is probably the most Academy-friendly movie he has ever made. But also, you were talking about the time period. I kind of do think Boyhood will be a little bit dated. And I do think Birdman will be dated. Uh, Whereas Grand Budapest is going to be completely timeless. Like, we can watch that movie 50 years from now because it's set, it's already, you know, it's 40 years in the past. It will age so well, and it will be one of those, like, classic Oscar picture, Oscar pictures. I can't talk today. When you're like, oh, what? remember that movie? Grand Budapest Hotel. It's just, it's everything of Wes Anderson mixed with everything of great filmmaking all in one. It's a full picture. Great, Rod. One, qu- I'm just, I'm curious. Did anyone else get confused why that kid was F. Murray Abraham when he grew up? Was, <laughs> when I was, because I was watching, I'm like, wait a second. <laughs> They're not the same race. And, and then, anyway, no, that, that wasn't that. anywhere else. No, no. <laughs> hey, but great choice. Um, Thoughts? I, I think that both the films that my compatriots uh, referred to are great directorial pieces, and I think that Boyhood should definitely win the Academy Award for Best Director for what Richard, Link, Richard Linklater accomplished. Interesting. Why over Birdman? Over which you Birdman, just said for, technically was so impressive. It was technically fantastic, but it wasn't done over twelve years. However, when you watch the film, the what the ride that the movie takes you on, I think Birdman is such an incredible story with amazing performances, not just by Michael Keaton. It was so cool to see him and that character in the. Fact that Michael Keaton had played Batman, add a little bit of something to it. Then when Edward Norton comes in, and Emma Stone, and Naomi Watts, and all these amazing, and Zach Galifianakis, and all these incredible performances, but again, the story, when I look at it for a best picture, I'm not just looking at technical aspects or whether the film's dated, I want to know how great the story is, and I think Birdman was such an incredible movie that you still talk about to this day, and you wonder about the ending, and you get to talk about and have conversations with your friends about what actually happened at the end, or what was this whole thing reality, or was it all in his head? It's just such a it is such an amazing thing and I think that's why 10, 20 years from now you'll still talk about Birdman because you just want to keep talking about this world. I still, I think you'll talk about Michael Keaton's performance in Birdman. Yeah. That's why I think you describe best actor. I think Boyhood is best director. I think Budapest is best picture. Well, here are my two thoughts on those. Uh, Grand Budapest Hotel, I agree. I, I liked it a lot. It was, I think it was in my top 10 list this year. Uh, I I thought it I liked it for you know, I thought it was a return to form for Wes Anderson. He didn't look like he was having fun um, for his last few movies to me, and this seemed like a return to form. But I don't think it's his best movie. I think Royal Tenenbaums is his best movie, and I agree that it is getting so much recognition of the academy from the Academy because it is a career award because he has done so many great movies. I don't think this is his best one. I think it's really good. I don't think it, but it, it's not in the best picture. Birdman. I actually agree with Jason. When I hear people talk about Birdman, I hear them talk about Michael Keaton, and I hear them talk about Emma Stone, I hear them talk about the performances and the the cinematography, the technical part of it, but I don't think the movie, I think the, the parts don't add up to a, to a cohesive whole. I think it's very impressive on several fronts, but the movie as a whole is a bit of a jumble. I, I was watching it, we got toward the end, and we got to a certain point, I'm like, okay, great, this movie's gonna end, and then it kept going for 10 minutes, and we got to another point, and I went, okay, great, this movie's gonna end, and then it kept going for another 10 minutes. I, I could kinda, make that same argument for Boyhood. It was too much of a yeah, yeah, you didn't feel like that when the kid was 14? You're like, <laughs> well, no, are you when he's 15? The kid was just like, I'm, to go. I'm gonna take pictures, and I was like, I don't care anymore. <laughs> yeah, but he wasn't done growing up. Like, like it's not about, it's not about, it's about this complete picture of this kid growing up, and it's about the evolution of his family. It's about the evolution of himself and how he separates from his family. Birdman, I think, kind of just kept going. It kind of said everything it needed to say about Michael Keaton and his character, and then it's like, and then just kept heaping stuff on top and more stuff and more stuff. So by the end, I'm just like, uh, you know, it was such a kind of straightforward movie, and then it just veers off into this direction. And I think that in 20 years, people will be talking about the performances of the movie. I don't think the movie itself is going to hold up on its own over time. I think uh, I think Boyhood was an incredible achievement. I think Grand Budapest Hotel was a really fun movie, but I think as far as what the Academy looks for for Best Picture, I think Birdman had everything. I, it's I think it's too non-traditional. If you're gonna just get into the nitty gritty of it, I don't think you know. Again, the and that's why Grand the, Budapest I, I Hotel they, will win because it's traditional. But but Boyhood <laughs> sure should win. But Boyhood is also in in its own way, it's a very classical tale of growing up over time. It's very experimental. It's people get respect it. Grand Budapest again. I think it's 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 
in a weird way, Boyhood is the most mainstream and accessible of these movies because Wes Anderson's style is not for everybody, and Birdman's style is certainly not for everybody. But that's you know that's beside the point. I think Boyhood is just an amazing achievement. Jason, do you think Grand Budapest is Wes Anderson's best film? Ooh, that's rough. Um, overall, yes. Technically, yes. Personally, I I love Royal Tenenbaums because of the music. So a lot you, more. But it's fair then you're saying it's his best Oscar movie. Yes. Got yes. It. It, it overall as a complete package, I feel it is his most like closest to 100% awesome film he's ever made. Because like I said, he pulled himself out of his head and he actually was just like, you know, I'm going to make a more accessible movie. I mean, it has a brilliant performance by like Ray Ray Fiennes like steals that movie like so much. And the story of the boy growing up is a lot more complete to me than a lot of his other movies like uh, Darjeeling is very incomplete. Uh, but no, Grand Budapest is a complete package of his films. I'll agree. So, so called so realist, and I was just curious because I, I, I don't. I think we we should pick the best movie. We shouldn't we shouldn't pick the career movie. I feel like that's not the way the movie should go. It's what's the best movie that defined the year. That's the thing. And I, I I think Dan made some very strong arguments against both films in a way of that's not Grand Budapest. It's not. We shouldn't just award him to give it. Whereas uh, what you said specifically about the risk of taking not only doing the hook of Twelve Years of the Movie, which I think we all are, a lot of people get hung up on, but the fact that the kid was good and actually pulled off and his daughter he, he cast his own daughter all these things that could have just gone so wrong over the course of 12 years and the fact that it ended up being the piece that it was um i think is stands it out as a movie where i agree with everything both of you really said about birdman which is i think it's technically directed interestingly which i was interesting because you even gave the director to link later you can have the director <laughs> <laughs> i want best picture <laughs> but i think it is more the technical and the acting in that film versus the movie which is what we're arguing about so i gotta give it to boyhood uh, and dan Based on the arguments. He saw that belt and he got stars yeah. in his eyes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that was also very good two rounds. All right, one more Oscar-themed question before we move on to some pop culture stuff. Uh, this was an interesting question. Best performance, fight three to Q. Uh, best performance from a 2015 Oscar-nominated actor or actress. Now, this is career. They have to be nominated today, but what's the best performance overall? I'm just curious, so before we get to that, mm -hmm. what was the best performance this year? So we're, we're hitting Oscars and the fans say we did. Uh, any thoughts, Dan? Uh, my favorite was J.K. Simmons and Whiplash. I'd probably throw Julianne Moore and still Alice in there. Michael Keaton, Birdman. All great uh, people, and I feel like we've hit, we've we've been tackling that subject so hard. Mm -hmm. Let's go wider. And what's the best one ever, based on any of the people that are nominated in supporting or mm -hmm. actor or actress? Uh, and let's start with you, Dan. Who would you think best performance by this year's Oscar nominations? Well, this one was tough because uh, it's kind of a good problem to have, which is that you have a lot of first time or second time nominees that don't have as, as extensive as a uh, record. But looking back on it, um, I ended up going with Edward Norton in American History X. I think it is an incredible performance. It's really he takes this character who at the beginning is just the most despicable person on earth and by the end of it just you see his evolution and you actually end up feeling sorry for him when you see the circumstances and you see what his life is and what it's turned into and it's really just one of the great character pieces that one of the great pieces of acting of probably the last 20 years uh, it was nominated for an oscar he didn't win for it but i think as time has gone on that movie has grown in a lot of people's estimation and edward norton is just incredible in it Jason, you're next. Um, I'm going to go with Robert Duvall in his role of Augustus McRae in Lonesome Dove. Um, it is the seminal cowboy role, but Duvall adds so much more to it because this cowboy is a romantic, and he keeps obsessing about this one perfect moment he had with a creek with his love that he let go away. And it's also in that role he physically embodies what the movie's about, and that is that the cowboys have to like basically give up the range they have to give up their times because the 20th century is a coming and and times have to change he has so much heart and he's perfect one of the, the cowboy should be rough and tumble because you're afraid of him but at the same time he should have a twinkle in his eye and that's something that robert duvall and i have a quote from robert duvall even himself uh, robert duvall believes that augustus mccray is his finest work and he said i quote the english can have their hamlet and king lear all play gus mccray anytime Oh, so he picked his own character as a great character. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Mark. I'm going to go with Michael Keaton in Beetlejuice because I think Michael Keaton's performance in Beetlejuice showed the entire range of what a great actor can truly <laughs> do. I mean, you look at that film, and that film has elements of horror and drama and comedy, and what Michael Keaton was able to do in that role was combine all of those things into this incredible character that's so unforgettable. They named the damn movie after him. I think that when you watch Michael Keaton in here, you take a guy who started as a stand-up comedian, then was a comedic actor, and then you see him in this film be able to expand his range into pretty much doing anything, and that's one of the reasons why he's being recognized for Birdman this year is because of an incredible career that I think is highlighted by Beetlejuice. Great. Thoughts on you guys? Which ones do you think are out of place here? Well, I I, I should probably call my great uncle to ask him what he thinks about Once of Dove because I haven't uh, <laughs> I haven't seen it. Ouch! Uh, You're missing. That's a bit, are you an Oscar out. voter, Jason? Um, <laughs> Uh, I uh, listen. I, well, Robert, Duvall come out. Robert Duvall is a movie. Robert Duvall, did, uh, uh, like ninety one. Like, is it? Yeah, I'm, sorry, I'm verifying the year. It's, that, it's, I always it's, thought it's, it's younger than movie. Beetlejuice. It, it <laughs> it's younger than Sweet. Beetlejuice. Well, it's, a it's a mini series. It's a mini series. It's a mini series. Does yeah. that count? You said it's best performance. You did not. You know, we well, did this not. This is movie fights. I figured. But Once of Dove is a TV movie mini series. So get off my back here. I Robert Duvall. I think Beetlejuice is the. Miss movies. Can you do a little research? Does a TV movie mini series? technically count as a movie? Well, I mean, if you think about it this way, I think you have to think about um, would this performance be nominated for an Oscar? That one would not be nominated for an Oscar. Oh, because come on. It could be nominated for an Emmy. Uh, it could win a Golden a Globe. Golden Globe. Yeah. I, I, I have, I'm fine, I'm fine. If you're going to make me backpedal, then I got an, I got a, I got a second Robert Duvall performance. Yeah. Uh, let's go. Bring it. All right, Apocalypse Now. Well, hold on. Do, do, you, do you guys agree with me? Does that seem like it's a little bit far-fetched reach to do a I mean, it said best Or should we let him fight? I, I think like you're, I think you're, you're knocking me out on a semantic. I'm going to, I'm going to pull a Dan Pout just... here. Here's my Dan Pout card. Uh, and, and this is semantics. I don't mind. Go ahead and you keep, said performance. Keep, keep arguing the your <laughs> performance. I don't mind. If Lonesome Dove wants to ride his wrinkly ass up to Beetlejuice's house, he's more than welcome to. Well, so let's keep it in. I think that's fair that I didn't make that clear. In all future battles, we should keep in mind it's called movie fights. Uh, that said, it's not <laughs> it called TV, TV movie. Yeah. <laughs> but, TV you know, miniseries. So it's a fine fight. Line. So, but you're, it's a fair point. So we're keeping it in. Uh, but Dan, you were going to say something. Uh, yeah, I mean, but I think Robert Duvall has been in so many great movies, Apocalypse Now, and then there was the, uh, there's one from the 90s where he was the preacher. I forget what the name of it is. Apostle. But, uh, up to the Apostle, The Godfather and Godfather 2. I mean, I think he's, there's so many more movies. That well, he's I, I want to say Tender this. Mercies, it, which he won the Oscar When you for. think Edward Norton, does anybody think American History X? No. They but that doesn't make it a not fight great, club. But it's not what's the most. Hey, you knocked me. Out, you knocked me out on a BS charge. So no, I got to throw everything no, I'm I got. I'm saying that he's he's got he's been in a lot of great movies that I think maybe were better. Um, I think and, with with Edward Norton too. It's a, it was a great character. It was terrifying, but it was very. He shaves his head and he's very one dimensional. Whereas yeah. oh, I think that no. I think that Keaton Absolutely could bring in elements not. of horror See, and I'm, comedy. I'm, you Absolutely know what? You've already knocked not. me out of this fight. I'm gonna team up. I'm going for Beetlejuice. We're gonna take, we're gonna take out Edward Norton. <laughs> okay. We're going. <laughs> Here's the thing about Michael Keaton is Beetlejuice. The movie's called Beetlejuice. There's surprisingly little Beetlejuice in the movie Beetlejuice. I'm not saying Michael Keaton isn't good, but he's in like what 20, 30 minutes of the movie. The movie really rides on the shoulders of Alec Baldwin and Gina Davis. American History X would not work without Edward Norton. He was key to the success of that movie, and it's just... It's, you can make the same argument movie. for Michael Keaton and Beetlejuice. See, I, I think you I, could put anybody. I, no, I think that I think that claim is like saying Jurassic Park succeeds on the on the shoulders of Sam Neill. It's yeah. like, yeah, he was the star of the movie, but you go see that film for the dinosaurs. Beetlejuice showed that Michael Keaton was more than just a comedic actor; that he had all this range, and that led to his role next year. Tim Burton saw what he did in Beetlejuice and was like, "Oh, this is his definitely got to be the guy." His performance in Beetlejuice for Batman. led to a cartoon, led to a guy being walking around Universal Studios at all times. And well, there's been no. sequels. <laughs> Warner Brothers wanting to make money led to all there's of action that. figures. There's also been sequel talk for Beetlejuice forever because yep. everybody wants to see that character. Character back on screen. It, it wants was to see so Keaton iconic. play it again. What else can scare? It, it scares you and it makes you laugh at the same time well, with the same character. Scare me. Listen, no, I'm not saying that he was bad in Beetlejuice. I'm just like the I don't Lost see, Souls room. I don't see what in Beetlejuice is any better than any of his other performances. I think Michael Keaton's a great actor and he was great in that movie as he's great in so many other movies. I think that Edward Norton. Th that performance is so amazingly deep and it's so complicated and complex and it's such a, a character that you have to take this journey from being this just hardcore neo-Nazi. He goes to jail. He learns about life. He learns about real life. He learns about, you know, he has to take his brother out of this world, the heartbreak at the end. And the fact that you see this character go on such an amazingly long journey 
journey from the beginning of that movie to the end of that movie where he's a completely different person. The work in that movie that Edward Norton does is incredible. I and it's think, only growing over time. I think Edward Norton is so much better in the role that uh, he, won, he, won a, he won an Oscar for his first role. Primal I don't know if he's nominated for Primal, Primal Fear. For Primal Fear. Mm-hmm. He's so much better in that role I think than, that's than, kind than, of than American sh- History X. That's a very showy role. That's a very showy role. It's like, oh, yeah, yeah. And then it gets real angry. And like, you know, I mean, it's not that he's bad, but it's very showy. It's very Oscar nominee. It's much more complex and much more subtle in American History X where he doesn't have this huge come to Jesus moment you see him evolve over time and realize what the world is actually like I just think that that moment too you go through his entire life you never once touch on the afterlife which is where you get to see all these incredible (laughs) things that Michael Keaton's character does after he's already dead and it's such a mysterious role and at the same time he brings such relatability to it it was just an amazing performance and it's one of those films that you still talk about today would you call it it Keaton's best performance absolutely what else did he have around that year do you have Keaton's uh, he had Batman the next he had Batman he had uh, clean and sober he had the dream team he had Mr. Mom. He had Gung Those Ho. Were after or Johnny Dangerously. They're all around the same time. I think Clean and Sober came out the same year, and Batman was one year later. I like Michael Keaton a lot. It's probably <laughs> that out. You know what came out the same around the same year as Batman? Lonesome Dove. <laughs> <laughs> you took yourself out yeah. on your own accord. So you bowed out. Me that, I, that you bowed out. I'll argue Patrick yeah. Swayze Dan in North Pelcar. and South. Dan <laughs> but everything Michael Keaton. Said. Everything Michael I said. Keaton, yep. That's all true. It's, it's to be fair, true. as good well as he is, Michael Keaton also had the support of the makeup effects and Tim Burton's style and everything else. Whereas the Edward makeup Norton, was very thin, though. Yeah, it was like a layer of white, man. Well, what? What yeah. <laughs> now we're now we're arguing semantics. <laughs> yeah. It's the performance, right? right? It's the performance. And again, I want one more piece from each of you. Why was the your performance better than the other one? Because Michael Keaton incorporated more different elements into that one character where you had horror and comedy and drama all in this one dude who you really, you meet him and he's funny, but he's also scary and terrifying and you want to get to know him more, but you also back off because he's been undead. Where the hell is this guy? How does he know the sandworm? There's so many interesting things about that character. Whereas I think Edward Norton, you look at him, oh, he's got his head shaved. He's a scary neo-Nazi. Is he going to go back to good? What's going to happen? I think it's more of a, of a one note performance. It's not one note, but it's less. Notes. I'm going to ask another question. Could you have put someone else in that role? That's the other. You could not have put no. anybody else as Beetlejuice other than Michael Keaton. That's why even to this day, that's why that movie hasn't been made again because you can't get anybody else to be Beetlejuice. Dan, same two questions. Uh, well, first of all, it's again, you said it, that he made it an interesting character, and I agree, Beetlejuice is an interesting character, but Edward Norton's character is complex. It has a lot of moving parts. Beetlejuice is fun. He's funny. He does crazy stuff. He spins his head around. I'm not knocking Michael Keaton. You know, he's really good at that movie. But the level of acting that Edward Norton does in that film is absolutely incredible. The, just the detail work, the work he put into his character, the fact that you can track this character across the movie, and the intensity of it. Um, I think that it's a completely different kind of acting, and it's on a di- kind of a different level than the Beetlejuice acting, which is much more broad, which is much more, you know, cr- oh, I'm a crazy character, blah, 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 you know. Again, it's, it's a whole different thing, but I think it makes it a better performance because it's a much more complex performance. I think and, more people could have done that role than I think there's only one dude that could have done Beetlejuice. Even somebody like Jim Carrey, I don't think could have pulled off Beetlejuice the way know, Michael Keaton I mean, that's a very hypo- that's a very theoretical hypothetical. I live in is, theoretical arguments. It's like, could somebody else have been Beetlejuice? I don't know. Maybe. I, it's. I mean, that's such a weird co- the kind of a basis for a question. As I, I, somebody I think could have come in and played Beetlejuice. Yeah. Well, I got to make a call. So uh, it's this is tough. I'm I'm listening to what you guys said to make the point. I think what you're really arguing over is comedy versus drama. In a way, is what I'm hearing, um, which I think is sort of unfair. And I I do think. I do think it's harder to do comedy in a way sometimes than drama. Well, I'm not. I'm not framing it as comedy versus drama. I'm just looking at the performances individually and what those performances required of the actor. I'm not saying that anyone is harder than the other. I'm just saying that I think that Edward Norton's was more complex and he had to do a lot more and a lot more subtly than Michael Keaton had to do, which is much more of a broader character. Well, if you want to spin it back to the Oscars, it's totally it's drama. But I think there's a lot of really strong actors who can do performances like that. Whereas I do think there was something specific about what Keaton did in combination with Tim Burton that created a performance that really did I think withstand a, a larger uh, time plus I can't account for the fact that another panelist sided with him so you have to factor <laughs> that in your point what well. so now Jason's actions count against me <laughs> well, when, people, when someone in the panel when someone in the panel changes their opinion to go with a fighter I have to count that so sadly Mark gets the point hey it's a small it's win for stressing. comedy Dan's because one down from losing that belt the academy never recognizes Whatever. comedy but thank god Screen Junkies movie fights Screen that's, that's what you get for talking bad about Augustus McCray <laughs> Lonesome Dove wins again. <laughs> Screen Junkies weigh in on the comments. <laughs> Round four. 
Uh, all right, so we hit our, our Oscars, our first half of the show. We got a little, uh, let's get something more, uh, something different. Uh, speaking to reporters at an industry event in New Zealand, James Cameron said that the first Avatar sequel of the three proposed sequels will be pushed back a year and arrive in 2017. This brings up a good question, which Brain, oh, Brain or Brian? Was, what, did we do that right, or is his name actually Brain? <laughs> it's probably Brain. All right, hope, Brain, hope that is right. Brain T. Carswell on Twitter asked us, do we need more Avatar sequels? Uh, and I want to start with you, Jason. Um, my answer to this would be no, but since this episode has already been knocked off the rails, I'm going to go devil's advocate here. You're I'm going gonna, for double points. I, I'm, I'm going for devil's uh -oh. advocate here to try to catch up, and I'm going to say yes, that there should be Avatar sequels. There should All be right, an Avatar 2. He's allowed to do that, everybody. Yep, an Avatar 2 and an Avatar 3 and an Avatar 4. But, I what? I, there we go, yes. But what I want to see is that since Avatar is an environmental movie, I want to see Avatar 2, 3, and 4 uh, uh, remake themselves as other environmental movies. So I want to see Avatar 2 is Fern Gully. With a, they're against the giant machine and there's a talking bat. Uh -huh. I want to see Avatar 3 is based on that Steven Seagal movie on Deadly Ground, which is also environmental. And then Avatar 4 goes <laughs> completely crazy and is based on an inconvenient truth. So it's James Cameron with a PowerPoint. And get Schwarzenegger in there and get Bill Paxton in there, who we haven't seen in an Avatar movie yet and we need to see in an Avatar movie. There We're really go. going off the rails. Mark! <laughs> and then Avatar 5 can just be Sting playing a concert in there 3D in a rainforest. <laughs> Done! I mean, I also think that, I do think that we need Avatar sequels because I think that it, we got introduced to this incredible world and it was not only neat filmmaking, the story wasn't the, it wasn't the greatest story I've ever seen. I left the theater more talking about the cinematic achievement, but I want to get to know this universe more and I think that when you have a James Cameron behind it that there's got to be a deeper master plan behind creating this world Pandora. So I want to go back to Pandora and I want to visit it. I think there's so many more stories to tell here and it's rare that you get a setup like what James Cameron gave us. I mean, look, we have great franchises right now in movies. It's a great time to be a fan of comic book films or of outer space movies like Star Wars coming back and I think that there's no reason why we can't welcome back Avatar into movie theaters as well. I want to see more because I trust James Cameron. If this was a guy like a Michael Bay making these movies, I'd be like, oh, not another Transformers. We don't need more trashy franchises. We need more franchises that have heart, and like what Jason said, that actually could have a message built in there as well with the environment. So yes, we need more Avatar movies. Dan, no, we don't need more Avatar <laughs> movies. I just, <laughs> I just put my heart out. We don't need more Avatar <laughs> movies, and I'll tell you why. I think if you ask the, the 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 average person on the street, what's the highest grossing film of all time? They probably mostly still say Titanic, <laughs> and the reason why is that. Avatar made a lot of money because it was, a the it was a theatrical experience that really nobody had experienced in quite some time, the kind of immersive 3D thing. Uh, and people went for the experience. They went to see it uh, on a big screen with the 3D. We get that every single week now. We've had movies like Gravity that do the same thing. Even movies like Godzilla that do the IMAX 3D experience. If, if Avatar hadn't come out, Gravity would have made twice as much because nobody would have seen anything like that before. When was the last time you met up with somebody on a Monday morning? Like, hey, man, what did you do this weekend? He's like, oh, I popped in Avatar. Nobody <laughs> watches be surprised. Avatar. Nobody watches <laughs> Avatar because it was, a, it was a cinematic experience. It was kind of a lightning in a bottle. And we're now, what, uh, came out two, we're Five now years. seven years? Seven years? It came out 2008, uh -huh. so I think we're now seven years removed from Avatar. We're going to have two more years removed from Avatar. Nobody is going to care about Avatar when it comes out again. It's not, I, I'll call it right now, it's not going to be as well, successful actually, as the first one. And it wasn't, I'm sorry, that good of a movie. The story was weak, the characters were stock characters, people went to see it because it was a unique theatrical experience. Which is not unique. Well, anymore. I'll say serious answer. Like, I if if they if, if they take Avatar two, who are you siding with? I, I'm I'm still, still four. On, okay, I'm going you need four. Need to make a strong yes. argument because your first uh, round was pretty whack. <laughs> <laughs> that was a whole point. Yeah. Man. Go ahead. That All was right. a money uh, round. I, the, the most fascinating part about Avatar to me was the the mechs and the army and the stuff like that, and especially the part that uh, uh, the the lead general guy was originally supposed to be played by Schwarzenegger. And I, if they, which would have been awesome, which would have been amazing. <laughs> so that's what I'm saying. Like, if you do Avatar two and Give me Schwarzenegger in there, and and then it, it, I like the Avatar world a lot. But like to me, the more fascinating part about it was what is Earth like that we need this crazy element, and they need to cut that out. But this crazy element so much that we are willing to burn planets down for it. Like so, I want to know more about the Mech world, and I want to know more about the Earth, and make the Avatar part like make it a perfect half and half movie. Give me more of the Mechs and that army, and like. I'm there in Avatar 2. Like, if that if that's there and Schwarzenegger is the lead general of, like, Earth and his army, awesome. And you, you want Avatar, but completely different. No, I want, I want, I want 
them to f- to focus a little bit more on the mechs because in the first movie the, the mech and the general yeah, he was just like the two bit villain kind of guy whereas I'm saying if you bring him in make him into a real person like make him like Hicks in Aliens another Cameron movie like where he has a decent part of the movie but we still have the avatars there and stuff like that I'm in it's a very compelling story the fact that you're getting a trilogy too is so exciting to me because it means that there is going to be a lot of deeper storytelling involved not only with the humans that we get but also with the Navi the natives of Pandora and Dan to your point I mean when you say that that Avatar furthered the art of cinema and the way that we experience movies, that was incredible. You're right, we would not have had gravity if we didn't get Avatar, and so now you're saying, oh, the guy that made Avatar, nah, he shouldn't do another one 10 years later when we could get another cinematic achievement. That's like saying, you know what, let's stop with black and white. We don't need to go to color. We got our talkies on the big screen. It's done. <laughs> That's all the cinematic entertainment and, I need. And another, it could yeah. further the but art of could, going to the movies could, again. This could but, be his new Terminator 2. But what further experience this could are be his you going to make with too. 3D? I don't know what you can do. (laughs) That's why it's exciting. Go underwater. Here's more crap (laughs) popping out of of the screen. What I'm saying is that he didn't invent 3D. He brought 3D back. It wasn't a new thing. People have been doing 3D since the 1950s. It was dead for a while. Cameron brought it back. It's been at theme parks for 10 years before James Cameron decided to make a movie of it. And I'm saying, like, great, it brought it back. Now a lot of different movies can do that. And that was the only compelling reason to see Avatar. Everybody said, oh, how was Avatar? Oh, man, it looked great. But how was the movie? Well, it was kind of boring. But that's like saying, like, oh, I saw Star Wars. Now all these other movies are going to outer space. So, no, we don't need to see another Star Wars I know movie. Star the Wars. guy that did a I great 3D with Star film. Wars. <laughs> Avatar is no Star Wars. <laughs> I'll agree with that point. I, I, I will totally agree I, with that I still point. Think, I still think, I mean, Terminator 1 was an okay film, but it wasn't great. Terminator 2 was a masterpiece. Avatar 1. Pretty good film. Not that great. What if Avatar 2 is a masterpiece? What if he can knock it out of the park? I want to see it. And again, we're talking about James Cameron here. We're not talking about some schlub who has a lot of hits and a lot of misses, too. James Cameron does well with sequels. He cares about his material. He made us all dudes love the movie Titanic, okay? (laughs) That's a love story movie about a boat that's sinking, and we all were crying during it. Imagine what this guy's going to do with more Avatar. Go ahead. Sorry, real quick. James Cameron has made one sequel to his own movie, which is Terminator 2. But he also made Aliens, which was a pretty good but, sequel. Yeah, that was a pretty good sequel. sequel. That was his own movie. That wasn't in the same tone as the first one. That may as well have been Alien. He still makes good sequels. Point still stands. Avatar is going to be his own movie. One good sequel, Terminator 2. It was over 20 years aliens ago. Aliens is I'm not a good sequel? James, <laughs> no, I'm telling you that Aliens, he, he didn't make Alien at Aliens. But he made Alien, made so he alien, made a sequel. But he's not a sequel to his own movie. He but hasn't, it's he hasn't he attempted has another one. one sequel to one of like his own problems. movies, which is Terminator 2. It's semantics. And what I'm saying is that I would much rather see him. He is a visionary. Great. You created a great world. Done. I want to see what else you have. You don't need to keep going back. Three more of these. Three. Not one. Not two. Three more of these. This is ridiculous. He has more to tell us. No, he doesn't. Yeah. What more? Fern Gully already told us everything that Avatar needed to tell us. And Pocahontas. And Pocahontas. Thank you, Miss Movies. So... Wow, that was that. Your last little bout helped you there because I got to be honest, I was leaning towards Mark because Mark makes a point, which I think is valid. Of who knows what he's going to bring us, and we want to see what James Cameron brings us because we all have to be honest. Honest, his track record is pretty good, and I also I and I want to ask each of you. I, I, we all agree it's not a great movie, but when you watched Avatar, did you not just like phase out and say that was cool, and then? As it settled, you didn't like it, but did you really not have a fun theater experience when you watched Avatar? I walked out of Avatar thinking like, that was cool, and two hours later, I forgot about the movie. I had a great theater experience, and I was like, that has a lot of potential in there. Let's see what more we can do with this. It wasn't like, oh, I never want to go back here. What a crappy movie. It's like, man, there's a lot of cool stuff you could do there. It was almost like you got to go to a zoo for a couple hours, and you had to leave before you saw all the really cool stuff. It's like, no, let's go back there, and let's see what else is in this world. I think I'm still leaning towards Mark, sadly, because the reason why I it's think not the sad. question <laughs> for Dan, I'm saying I see his eyes. <laughs> Sadly for Dan. Uh, you invented because... this belt just so you could take it away. <laughs> yep. Didn't you? Yep. I did not. Um, you chose your points. Uh, the reason we want to see it is because of the point you said, which is we have to trust in trust of James Cameron, who makes amazing theater experiences, has had made great movies. He has made great sequels. He's never had the chance to build a franchise. Well, I mean, could it suck? Of course it could suck. But he's he's done pretty amazingly in this track record. His second movie out from Titanic, which everyone said it was going to suck, including all of us, blew Titanic away. So, I mean, we can't ignore the fact that this guy has built enough cred that if he wants to go play in Pandora with his dumb animals for three movies, <laughs> all right, let's see what he does. It yeah. could be a huge flop and a failure. But I got he, if he's not passionate about it, what's he, you know, what's... 
what we're gonna make them say no no stop doing that and do something else i'd rather have that than nothing and i feel like it's what the out of what you said so uh and that was a fair that was a, a good debate you made a good point of i wish you'd do something else but i while that's a strong debate do you really want to do something he's not passionate about? No, the question was, do we need more Avatar sequels? <laughs> I do not need any more Avatar sequels. But I think we do need more James Cameron. Yes, just but not lives. doing Avatar. Well, then if we didn't do the Avatar sequels, we wouldn't get James Cameron. So, yes, we need him to get it out he of the system. He just explored the ocean for years. So, I, Mark has the point. Uh-oh. Now, if I you had taken this early on and thought as hard as he did. I could see the writing you, on the you wall. Might, you might have, there's still a speed I, round at the end I'm of this I'm just trying to sabotage Dan. Dan at this point. I can tell. <laughs> I'm just happy I, I got points. It's, it's I'm just happy I got points. Can I just say this is twice in a row that Jason has pulled an audible and teamed up against me? <laughs> <laughs> it's also just fun for those at home because both of these guys work for me, but he technically works for him. So yep. someone's going to be mad at me at the end of the They're going to be mad at each other, so this will be a very fun day tomorrow. You guys are all in the Schmo studio. Just to remind everybody. <laughs> all right. Uh, round five. We got to get through these. Let's see. Best biographical movie. Uh, Marissa Prudy asked us this great question because of the Oscars and because of Selma and all these movies. What is our best biographical movie? And we're going to start this time with the round uh, with uh, Mark. I'm going to go a little different than you might expect. And I was thinking like Lincoln would be a good biopic. And then I was like, that was a little snapshot of that guy's career. The entire life of Howard Stern gets told in private parts and it gets told by the guy who lived it. And so when you talk about a biopic, you want to get to know somebody, you know, Howard Stern through and through by the end of this film, you get to see his upbringing. You get to see how his radio show became the phenomenon that it is. It's an amazing achievement and it's got it, arguably the most kick-ass soundtrack of all time. Dan, I'm going with Raging Bull. I think it's, it's it's obviously an American classic. It's one of Scorsese's best films. And if you want to go by the criteria of how well do you get to know the character, I think by the end of uh, Raging Bull, you know Jake LaMotta in and out. You know his strengths. You know his weaknesses. You know his downfalls. You see where his life, the, the, the recurring themes in his life and, and the pitfalls. And I think it's Robert De Niro's best work. And I think it's an incredible portrait of this very, very flawed man. Jason. I'm going with Ed Wood because I think it is Tim Burton's best movie. And not only that, it is Johnny Depp's best performance. It is a biopic about a filmmaker trying everything he can to get a movie made. And it's one of those biopics that it transcends that at certain parts, it almost seems like it's a biopic for Tim Burton himself. And it's a movie that every filmmaker needs to watch. Every film. If you're thinking about going in a film, you need to watch Ed Wood because it's almost going to be, so, there's going to be pieces of that that are going to be biographical of your own life. You took that biopic of Tim Burton point from Andy last week. <laughs> <laughs> Andy jumped in and argued. Oh, for settle down. <laughs> he is down on the scoreboard. He's got to do I've whatever got he's got to do. Scrap. <laughs> I got a scrap. I'm at a corner. <laughs> All right, Jake Lamotta, why was he better than the other two? I mean, you know, Private Parts, I, I'm i a huge Howard Stern fan. I, Private Parts is an immensely Bob funny movie. movie. I was Bob movie. Exactly. <laughs> I, I, I enjoy Private Parts. And Ed Wood is also an enjoyable movie. Martin Landau's funny in it. Has your grandpa seen uh, Raging Bull? Because, you know, my, my grandpa only watches that movie. <laughs> I could take this to a really dark place right now, but I'm not going to. You know what? To. Lonesome Dove loves um, Raging Bull. <laughs> uh, Raging Bull. First of all, if, to say that, are you saying that Raging Bull is for people's grandpa? No, I'm just saying, we, we, we brought up that point in a previous round about how old our movies were, and uh, yours is the oldest movie, I believe, well, of the three years. So. Lonesome Dove is old. It's just that old, <laughs> only old people watch it. There's a, there's a difference. Well done. Um, <laughs> Tell me a 20-year-old uh, that no, Raging, watches Raging Bull every weekend. I, I, I just think that the... the Tell us in the comments, uh, young yep. viewers. Who watches Raging Bull Raging every Bull or Lonesome Dove? Which have you watched? I'm curious. <laughs> the depth of the analysis of the character, I feel, in Raging Bull is the deepest. And that Private Parts is the fun story of how Howard Stern rose. It's a bit of his backstory and stuff. Ed Wood is an entertaining tale about Hollywood and how the Hollywood system works and how he made these movies. But I think Raging Bull is the best study of the man himself and d delving deep into his life and, and Joe Pesci with his brother-in-law and, and his family situation and, you know, just the, the, the traps that he got himself into. It's heartbreaking, like when he breaks the championship belt apart because he has to sell it and he takes it to the guy and they say, oh, well, if it was in one piece, it'd be worth something. And it's the fact that he keeps digging himself into a deeper hole. I need help here because we could all argue why each of your films are great. I think that's they're all great in their own ways. Why are they greater than the others? I think that I think that Private Parts achieves what the other films uh, the other films are great movies, but I think that Private Parts is the best at telling the story of this guy's life, and that's what you want out of a biopic. I think that with Martin Scorsese and with Tim Burton, there's always going to be a tendency to have the director be the star of his own movie that he's making, regardless of the story he's telling. With Private Parts, you get exactly to know Howard Stern, and like you said about Jake Lamotta, you get to know his strengths and his weaknesses, and you get to see how he's able to use both of those to his betterment, and you get to see there's a, there's a nemesis. 
person. There with pig vomit. There's the way that he grew up and how that shaped the way that he thinks about life. There's very embarrassing things that he tells. And so you're taking the arguably the most famous of any of these guys. He's more famous than Jake LaMotta or Ed, whatever was. And it's still telling the story without holding thing, holding anything back. And that's a very impressive achievement to me. I think Ed Wood is, is, is very simple because it touches and it goes straight to the heart of what Ed Wood is. And it expresses his life in all of his examples and all his fights, all his struggles, like the entire struggle. His entire purpose in that movie is the struggle to get these movies made. And we see that in so many scenes. That's almost exemplified in every scene of that movie. And plus just the fact that the filmmakers decided to do this choice of like, oh, Ed Wood made black and white movies. Let's make this a black and white movie. Let's, uh, uh, let's, and you want to go uh, like we also talk about like the the best Here's movie all well yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, the, be- the best the best movie <laughs> as well like uh, Patricia Arquette's in that Bill Murray's in it I mean they even tried to do uh, uh, like they gave us a piece of Bella Lugosi's life like any movie that's like I'm gonna put in Bella Lugosi and tell you part of his life like that that deserves a point there. Again, I'm struggling because you're all making very good points for your movies. Why are they? What makes I it a better biopic? Hold I, on, I, you're gonna get there. I, I need a clarification because I'm having. If someone wants to win, you need to help take down the other two. What makes it a better biopic than the other two? Dan, go ahead. I think that what makes Raging Bull a better biopic and a deeper movie than the other two, which are also good movies, is that is is the issue of stakes. What are the stakes of this movie? And in private parts, the stakes of the movie is is Howard Stern going to be a successful radio DJ? And Ed Wood, the stakes of the movie is can I you know make these crazy weird movies? In Raging Bull, the stakes of the movie is this man's life and his. Survival. I would argue Ed Wood is about that, that if he doesn't get that movie made, this guy is going to become a homeless man and go crazy. But you but you also see Jake LaMotta you see the stakes raised and then you see him blow it and you see what his life becomes and it's not just it's it's such a deep deep story about what happens to a man who self-destructs and the journey that he goes through and the toll that it takes on him and his family you know you see joe pesci just a shell of a man you see him in the jail cell just punching the wall and the fact that it's just this kind of deep story of just human despair and it kind of transcends just this guy to more of a tale on just humanity in general, it could apply to anybody. The fact that, that you can have everything in the world, but if you're not whole inside, then it doesn't matter. I don't think the private part should have to apologize, though, for Howard Stern, for its subject being more successful at what he did than Jake LaMotta. Like, it's not necessarily a deeper story just because Jake LaMotta struggled later in life. I think that Howard Stern wasn't just trying to be a successful radio DJ. He also was dealing with his relationship and trying to have a child. And the fact that, do I talk about this? Do I, How much of my personal life do I bring to my public persona? I think are all very interesting elements. So it's not just him trying to get a radio gig. It's a lot deeper than that. And you get to see the entire span of that crisis. Miss Movies, hold on, hold on. Fan cam. Miss Movies, I need some help with this, and I hear uh, you have a thought. Yeah. I do have a technicality if we want to discuss Yes, this. I'd love to hear a technicality. I feel like Private Parts is an autobiographical film because he wrote the book, and he is starring in it, and it is about him. Therefore, not a biography. Isn't, 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 an, isn't an autobiopic a subset of no, a biopic? absolutely not. Let's not get into this. <laughs> Mark, I agree, I agree that your choice is valid. I'm going to agree. I'll with give you a point if you argue with Lonesome Dove right now. <laughs> Robert no, Duvall's great at riding a horse. I, but my, I need but something because my last argument. argument wait, wait, I, yeah, I have an argument. My too, last argument would be that their stories are applicable to Ed Wood and Howard Stern, and that the stories are applicable to those characters. And I think that Raging Bull is applicable to more people because it's much more of a of a deeper story about the soul and self destruction. And I think that people can take more from it on a personal level than just the, the kind of stories of these people. Ed Wood, we all have, we all, everybody out there in the world, we have a, a side we show everybody, and we have a side underneath. And for Ed Wood, the side underneath is the side that will go crazy if he can't make movies, and he's also a transvestite. And that whole movie <laughs> is about Ed Wood struggling with showing his true self to the world. We all struggle with that. It's as simple as that. I think what's, why this is challenging is because I think all three movies do do that. Like they all, str- I mean, Howard Stern had, you know, with his parents and everything else, they, they all can make those arguments. So okay, I- Howard, the private, the private parts is in color. <laughs> Bill Murray. But- <laughs> well, I mean, if we're gonna go broader, Raging Bull also just as a movie is is a is a classic. And I can I'm not, tell you I'm not saying the other two aren't, huh? but uh, I can tell you their IMDb ratings. Uh, you want those? I, well, I think Raging Bull probably. I think Raging Bull would probably edge, there. edge yep. them. Yeah. I, I, in fact, I think it would be Raging Bull, Ed Wood, Private Parts. You got probably, it. Yeah. Good mm-hmm. job. I guess. I, think, I <laughs> thought so. Um, wow, this one's rough because I, I don't think either any of you really made an improper argument on this, and it's hard to not make a call here without being impartial because uh, not. So, do you want me to be impartial, or would you like me to just give you all points? 
I mean, well, look, I'll, that doesn't do me any favors, so obviously... Uh, I'll take the points. I'm still I, losing. I, I want you to shower us in points, Andy. <laughs> make the call. Let's just... Are I we mean, right now, let's yeah. gladiators make the call? Whatever, yeah. Make the call. We're here to fight. Yeah, there you go. We're here to fight. I think, uh, I think Jason said, because I actually, to be honest, they're all, I love them all equally. I, I really do love Raging Bulls. So this isn't a personal map page, but basically just a little bit of a, of a preference of how you guys argued it. I think it's the part you said about every filmmaker wants, wanted to, to, it's something they need to each watch and do it. To me is the only thing that made this more accessible to the broad community more than Raging Bull, which I don't think it does. I think all of them have that soul reach that you had. And I think Everyone wants to be. No one really wants to be a radio DJ anymore. I guess in a certain way. We all do. Look at us. <laughs> yeah. uh, we sure. got cans. We're talking into a mic. We want to be our <laughs> star. He wants to get out of radio. Ninety three point seven FM. Eleven twenty six in the morning. Uh, well, there's but, uh, WNBC. Just for that slight win. Oh. I'm gonna give it to Ed Wood. Oh, it yes. was a hard one. It was a hard one. I'm finally on the board. Hashtag lonesome duck. <laughs> Ed Wood had uh, no Van Halen right. songs this in it whatsoever. Because now Dan and Jason are tied, and Mark's in the lead with Whoa. three. Uh, and that was not on purpose, Dan. I'm, I'm, I'm Listen, grasping at straws. I have resigned myself <laughs> to what's happening. I'm just going to sit back. I'm going to do the best. Five I'm going to do the, the best end. job that I can. Second and place we'll see will have a chance for five points during the speed round. So anybody's game can still win. I can't predict who's going to win this. <laughs> I honestly can't because of the speed round. Uh, round six. Chris Hemsworth's new movie Black Hat just came out. Terrible reviews. Have you seen it? I dug it. Oh, yeah. you did? Yeah. All right, good. I, it, it largely based upon the fact that Chris Hemsworth is such a great star. I yeah. do like Chris okay. Hemsworth, and that's where we brought this up. Uh, it's a new segment I think we're going to do, we'll try to do every show or every two, uh, where we you guys have to pitch me a movie, okay? We like Chris Hemsworth. He's played a lot of jobs in his role. He's played a hack in his, in his movie career. He's played a hacker, a huntsman, a race car driver, the captain of a sp starship in Star Trek One, uh, a god, etc. He plays good jobs, right? So I mm -hmm. want you guys to pitch me round here, round fight six. Pitch me Chris Hemsworth next movie. Two two rules. It has to, he needs to have a specific job, which could be an existing franchise. It could be another movie, whatever. And he must uh, you must give me the title and the logline of, of said film. We all know that. You all mm -hmm, prepared mm -hmm. this. Hopefully you at home followed me as well. Uh, and this time we're going to start with you, Dan. Give me your, your pitch and your logline. Uh, so this is a combination comeback movie slash Chris Hemsworth vehicle. It's called Land Down Under. It stars uh, co-stars Mel Gibson as a retiring L.A. cop. Uh, he's got one last job, which is to take a fugitive uh, to Australia to hand it off to, surprise, his estranged son, played by Chris Hemsworth. They're both Australian actors. Of course, the fugitive escapes, and so it becomes a father-son movie uh, pursuing the fugitive uh, across the outback. It's got comedy, it's got action, it's got drama, and it's a great comeback vehicle for Mel Gibson. Logline? Wasn't that the logline? Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. I guess you're right. You don't have a tagline. Is what I was confused. Oh, about. oh that's no. fine. If you didn't well, prepare taglines, I have to think line. of one. Yeah. You didn't prepare taglines. It's fine. That was the logline. Good call. I, okay. Good. I want to watch that, Jason. Uh, I'm going with the. He's the leader of a biker gang, and I call this movie the Thunder Rolls. Uh, Chris Helmsworth is the leader of a local bike gang, the Thunder, and he has to sacrifice everything he can to save his family and his bar from a corrupt local sheriff. It's like Macbeth meets Sons of Anarchy. Imagine motorcycle action fights with Chris Helmsworth. You can even throw in. And his uh, brother Liam Helmsworth as 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 one of the other members of the biker gang, and it's set in Texas. So Chris Helmsworth as the ultimate biker gang leader. Go ahead. All right, I'll kick Mark. off <laughs> with my tagline. I think you guys are going to know what I'm talking about. I have the power. Chris Hemsworth playing Prince Adam slash He-Man in Masters of the Universe. What's Every, his job? He is He-Man and he's saving the universe. <laughs> What's He-Man's he job? His employment is he's a prince by day prince, yeah, and yeah. then he gets a handle of the sword and he goes to Castle Grayskull and he can defeat Skeletor. Everybody grew up with He-Man. We wanted to see a real Masters of the Universe. Not the Dolph Lundgren, Courtney Cox, uh, Frank Langella disaster from 1987. You can take the real subject matter here from the comic books and make it an incredible action action franchise and when you look at pictures of Prince Adam that is Chris Hemsworth he's the guy that can play Loin that cloth role. or pants for He-Man I uh, you can do you can do a, a mishmash you do we do we do you not get a little concerned cuz now I've heard your pitches I'm I got to shoot some darts at you guys to help mm -hmm. me answer cuz I, I want to do this one quick He-Man and Thor I feel like they're going to be pretty very similar, similar. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so is my problem is I want to see He-Man movie I'll, trust me I really want to see a movie but 
wouldn't you rather someone else tackle that franchise so it doesn't just feel like we're ripping off the Thor franchise? No, because there's such different characters. When you really get into the meat of what they're about and what they do, they're very, very different characters. Thor is part of a team with the Avengers. He's got his own gig on Asgard, but when you look at He-Man, he's the guy in charge, and you have one villain to go after, Skeletor, where it's not a constantly expanding universe, which is what Marvel does. This is an enclosed thing, and you can make it, you can make it a standalone movie, you can do a trilogy, but him as He-Man, everybody wants to see this film. Uh, Dan and Jason, thoughts on each other? I mean, I, I would like to see He-Man film. I don't think Chris Hemsworth is particularly the best He-Man. I think we've seen him play that note in Thor, and I think that would be kind of a lesser version of Thor. I'd much rather they find somebody who hasn't played a kind of godlike person with a lightning shooting weapon. Uh, but you want Mel Gibson as a cop. I'm sure he would, stop, he would love to stop working out for Yes, a exactly. Days. A poor guy. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, yeah, He-Man movie, maybe, sure, but I don't think Chris Hemsworth is the best choice. Why uh, is yours the best choice of the other two? I think that it's unique to Chris Hemsworth. I think it embraces his Australian roots. Uh, I think that Mel Gibson and he, they both have good comedic sensibilities. You know, Chris Hemsworth is kind of pegged as like the, 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 the Thor guy, but he actually does have some good comedic sensibilities. We've seen them in the Thor movies. I think teaming him up with another actor who is also shown that he has it and it's kind of a native son type production would just seem like a natural fit for him so we're okay bringing mel gibson back into the fold and i'm not i i think that, <laughs> listen he's he's had a really rough time he had a lot of years and he did some really despicable things but it, that's been a long time ago he's been pretty well behaved and you know at least in public lately and i think that that the fact that that he did so many things has overshadowed the fact that he was a great force in cinema and he's a very compelling movie star and i would like to see him make a kind of late career come Back. Jason? The Thunder Rolls is Roadhouse for the 21st century. I'll even go one better. Let's cast The Rock as the local sheriff. It's the ultimate <laughs> man ba badass fight on motorcycles with chains and in Texas. This is Chris Helmsworth. Is it Mad Max? It, it, <laughs> it, you could put some Mad Max in there. You could put some craziness in there, but let's, let's. this is the ultimate man's man movie because Chris Helmsworth, yeah, he's, he's got Thor, but, but Thor, if you think about it, is, is a prince. So, like, even though he's rough and tumble and he can and he smash things, he's that. Chris Wildsworth really hasn't had the chance to get this nitty gritty role. And Sons of Anarchy just finished very popular show and tie this into that that motorcycle craziness that uh, is, is sweeping the lands. Hashtag lonesome dove. And, uh, you know, I think you've got a badass movie. This is a badass movie. Rock versus Chris Helmsworth on bike. Can I just make a quick note? Go ahead. H Hemsworth. Sorry. There you go. <laughs> Mel Gibson. See, he loves L so much, no, that's why he picked yep. Lonesome Dove, yep, and now yep. he's got the L in Hemsworth. I'm going to say this. Is I, think you're <laughs> I, I, look, I like Black Hat, and but a, a, like Andy said, a lot of critics didn't like it. And my fear with Chris Hemsworth's career is that if you make Dan's movie or make Jason's movie, the, the risk is that it's another Black Hat where you look at what Chris Hemsworth would be able to do after the Avengers. Because look, Infinity Gauntlet 2018-2019, that's going to be the end of these Avengers, and they're going to go off to Inhumans, and you're going to have a different cast of characters be the stars of Marvel franchises. So what's the action? franchise that Chris Hemsworth can go to, can be bankable, that we as fans can see one of our great action stars be in. It's a great standalone film, what you're talking about, but He-Man Masters of the Universe would be a here's, franchise. Here's what, I, I, wanna, think that, I think that mine would quick. offer him... Okay. Oh, you want me to, I think that mine... You're saying, like, what action franchise would he move on to? I'm saying that, like, I think that he's more than an action star. I think that he's got charisma, and I think that he's capable of more, and this would be a chance for him to break out of that and be in kind of a comedy, more of a comedy than an action movie, and kind of show a different side of it. Which he's doing now, and then I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Miss movies, but uh, the, the vacation reboot isn't he attached to be uh, in that with uh, uh, Christina Applegate or something? Is he cousin Eddie? Uh, <laughs> but I think he's a comedian. He has a he's going the comedic route to try and make some shots, which I think is a fair point. Uh, here I'm struggling. You really gave us the Nick Mundy pitch, to be perfectly honest. Yeah, they somebody's got it. Even Deep had the rock in it. everything out there. Somebody's Sons got of Anarchy, it. the movie. Nick Mundy has already tweeted little, the Rock to ask him if he wants little, to be in the movie. It just felt a little all over the place. Where I, where I am a little worried about the Mel Gibson thing. I did like him in Expendables three. It was nice to see him back. If you can take all the other BS aside, right? Like, that's what I'm saying. Like I do miss him as the, the actor, not as the person. But that wasn't the ideal comeback for him because he didn't really have a lot of real estate. This is where this is putting him back in his comfort zone. But here's my here's my other struggle with you. I I want to see him. He Man the movie, but you got He Man's silly. Like, let's be honest. He Man the he cartoon is silly. Yes. If you so take a car, they're gonna have to upgrade it, and I feel like they're gonna do too similar to a Thor type of thing. You don't have to upgrade it. You have to go back to the 
original lore, which is more different than Thor, and it's not the cartoon that we all grew up loving. Look, I loved watching He-Man when I was a kid. I used to try to run like him outside, and that's why I still struggle running to this day, <laughs> is that when you look at He-Man, the actual content that it came from, the Masters of the Universe, that is a really interesting story that I think can be but appreciated by about, multiple generations. I'm, that, I don't disagree with you, but Chris Hemsworth as He-Man, to me, it's too much baggage when he's already Thor, which Dan said. Coupled with Dan's thought there and the fact that yours is a little over the place. I'm giving Dan the point. Ah. Oh. <laughs> they were late on the Back applause. The yeah, yeah, were... yeah. <laughs> All right, we have one more. The fake crowd's not so even we, we're running, These shows run late, and I want to make sure the fights happen. So we've cut the eighth round, and we're going to go to speed round as our eighth round moving Ooh. forward. So we have one last round here before our speed round. So this really does matter um, to, to get the points. Uh, round seven. The question uh, is tied into this week's Honest Trailer because this is our last one before the speed round. Um, the clue is, it's a franchise that gave Johnny Depp uh, an Oscar nomination for his role. Was that his first Oscar nomination too? Uh, I believe I think it was, it was yeah. his first Oscar nomination. Um, so which brought up, uh, you guys can figure that out, I hope. Yeah. Uh, which brings up, the. this is a fun one, worst, worst, <laughs> worst Johnny Depp performance. And we're starting with you, Jason. I'm going with his laziest performance, uh, and that is <laughs> Tonto in the Lone Ranger. He took the part and he said that the whole reason he wanted to take the part because he wanted to expand the part beyond, you know, uh, yo Kimosabi, you know, the these monosyllabic idiot basically than that, that that show and when he was said in his research he was looking for a, a painting and he did this painting called uh, um, I am the crow and that's where the, the the makeup comes from that's where the dead stupid bird we don't like dead stupid birds on your heads mm. anyways and when the movie came out he was still yo Kimo Sabi da 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 the only creative thing in that entire performance is how he got Hollywood to pay him for it because it was so lazy. <laughs> uh, Mark? I think that, I, I mean, it was really bad what he did to the Lone Ranger franchise, <laughs> but there's no greater crime than ruining everybody's collective childhood with his interpretation of Willy Wonka playing him as a creepy velveteen pedophile. That was one of the worst <laughs> performances I've ever seen in movie history, spitting on Gene Wilder. Gene Wilder must have rolled over in the old folks home that he's currently staying at <laughs> because he created one of the greatest characters of all time with Willy Wonka. He was magical, he was funny, he was mysterious, and Johnny Depp and to his detriment, Tim Burton as well, made a film that just completely ruined an entire generation of kids to Willy Wonka. Dan? Uh, I'm going with, uh, Jason wants to talk about lazy performances. I think by far the worst th the worst I've ever seen Johnny Depp is in the movie Transcendence, which came out last year. It was one of the worst movies of last year. And Johnny Depp is just, from the second on screen, he is checked out. He is not home. The lights are on, there's nobody there. He's in the movie for about five minutes, and then he's in a computer for about the next 60% of the movie. And he's literally <laughs> sitting on a monitor. He probably shot it at home. They probably paid him $20 million to really shoot it. really did feel like he did a favor to Yeah, Wally yeah, Fester. exactly. He's like, he's doing oh, a favor. Oh, you might be impo important someday. It's like, hey, Johnny, can you sit in your basement for a few hours and say these lines? He's like, what's going on? What are you doing? It made HAL 9000 look lively. And then he comes back kind of as a human, and he's still like, what's going on? It's the most lazy, monotone, no effort put behind it performance I've ever seen him Couldn't do. Couldn't he made the argument that the whole movie is that way, though? Not just his performance that the, the whole, the, the whole the, movie well, creates that the Lone Ranger the whole movie sucks yeah, yeah, too yeah, I mean yeah, I, I know I know I, all these movies are pretty terrible we're talking yeah. about I think that the all difference between Troubling the Chocolate Factory the remake versus the Lone Ranger or Transcendence I think the Transcendence Johnny Depp you're right he's stuck in a computer for most of the time so he doesn't have a lot of room for movement and with the uh, w with uh, the Lone Ranger he's playing the second banana to a really bad first banana Army Hammer when he's playing Willy Wonka he's supposed to be the life of that movie he's supposed to be the charm, the reason why the kids want to go back and see it again, and he totally dropped the ball with such a horrendous interpretation of that character. I think that that movie was banking on him being great. Transcendence could have been a really cool story, and it wasn't. The Lone Ranger could have been a great star-making turn for Army Hammer, and it wasn't. But Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, Johnny Depp had to carry that movie, and my God, did he drop that thing. And Johnny Depp also, uh, for Tonto, white man playing a Native American part. So we want to go back to that very beginning. <laughs> But what, Roll right there. What like he me, felt like he was like, I have to do this and play it monosyllabic. What for me makes Transcendence the worst Johnny Depp performance is that he wasn't into it. With Tonto and with Willy Wonka, he tried something. Did it work? No, it didn't work. But he was making an effort. He was trying to construct a character. Transcendence, he made no effort 
whatsoever. I think he just watched character. a lot of Lone Ranger reruns. He made no character, <laughs> he no effort whatsoever to make his character distinctive or to make him stand out in any way, to make him compelling. He was checked out. You could tell his heart was not in it. He but probably makes, hey, he was probably in between white makeup movies, and he was just. But wasn't what, that the point of what, what makes Transcendence worse than like a movie, another crappy movie that he did, like The Tourist, where he was basically himself too? What's the I, difference? I think the point of Transcendence was the fact that he's turning into a computer, and so by nature you're going to look checked out, and you're going to be boring. You're going to just be this kind of whitewashed thing. Like you're going to just be like an Apple store when the lights aren't on. I mean, that's what that character required. Willy Wonka required you to be great and be kid-friendly, and it was just so not that at all. I think he was going for the tone of being a mysterious computer, at least with that, or he was making an effort with Tonto. Oh, he there made, was no effort. He made a hell of an effort. <laughs> I think he made a hell of an effort doing his crazy looks and something with Willy Wonka. He totally, it was the farthest that he's ever missed the boat. And I think, well, but he missed the, but he was still making an effort, even though the character was off the mark. And I think there's a difference between being a robot and acting robotic. Michael Fassbender in Prometheus was very good as an android at doing a robotic thing. The acting was good because he put some effort into it. Johnny Depp took I'm a computer to mean I'm not going to put any effort into this performance whatsoever. I'm going to say everything in the same monotone. And it's just, you can, it's, you, you can tell when an actor has checked out of a role. When an actor has checked out of a movie, he's doing it for a favor, he's doing it for a paycheck, for whatever reason he did it. And for me, the reason that Transcendence is his worst performance is because Johnny Depp has made his name on commitment and he had no commitment. But it sounds like you're arguing later. Easiest performance, yeah, though. and I, I want to. Well, no, I think Dan's making a very valid fight. But he said something interesting, which you didn't respond to. How is it different from the tourist? I think the tourist was more. I'm Johnny Depp, and I'm playing Johnny Depp. So at least he's playing Johnny Depp. At least he's playing somebody, even if it's himself. In Transcendence, he's not playing a character. He's just speaking words into a camera. There's but a difference. When you're also talking about the reasons why you take a role, if you want to take Transcendence to help out Wally Fist, or you want to take Tonto because it hasn't been seen on screen in so long, that's that, that that's a lot more noble than taking. Like he should have never even taken on the role of Willy Wonka. That was just that that was doomed from the start, well, and he made it even worse. Burton. Yeah, whether he should yeah. have or not, he did, and and, and it's probably tried to like, do go something. further, go further. Yeah, he tried to to make something. So Dan, who do you think was worse, Tonto or Willy Wonka? Out of the two. Oh boy. <laughs> Now, now it comes to I would, want to say, no. I would say Tonto is probably a little bit worse because I think he was trying to be interesting in Willy Wonka even though he failed spectacularly. I think Tonto was more of a, you know... Uh, we're not talking about effort, though. We're talking about what was his worst... We're not talking about, oh, I tried harder but in this think, movie. I think strangely that yeah. Willy Wonka is a more, as weird as it sounds to say, a more complex performance than Tonto. And right. then Jason, thoughts Willy Wonka versus... Willy Wonka. Sentence? Willy Wonka. Was worse than Transcendence? Yeah. How come? Uh, I mean, because... You're just teaming up against Dan. No, yeah. no, 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 That's what you get, hashtag lonesome dub. Uh, uh... No, uh, Willie Robert Duvall's like, why is my character trending Willy, on Twitter? Willy, Willy... <laughs> <laughs> Willy Wonka, yeah, it, it just... Like... I don't, I don't think he was trying with Willy Wonka. I think it was literally like he walked in and I think Tim Burton was like, let's make this more and more like Michael Jackson. Like to me, <laughs> I've seen Lazy Transcendence Johnny Depp in like five other movies. I've seen it like he like like you can have almost you say seen it. Transcendence. I have not seen Transcendence. Well, there you go. But I've seen you the don't know how bad. It's I, bad. I saw it's how bad. lazy he was in the trailers. It's and I don't see any further. But like he's, I've seen that in the Taurus. I've seen that in the Rum Diaries. I mean, I can. But count you off. haven't seen this. I'm telling you, watch this movie. You have. Never I don't want to watch that movie. Luckily, I've seen all three. Less so I don't want to. <laughs> but Willy Wonka just yeah. Willy Wonka is like a, a car wreck. Let me ask you guys. Here's my problem because I because I have to make a decision. So I want to. I'm guiding you guys. Trying to a little bit. I, they're all terrible, right? Yeah, they're all terrible. What, what you said was phased me, and I wrote it right down. He was spitting on Gene Wilder. So there's a re, there, to me, I think there's probably, a, you know, the heart of all of us, it was extra bad because it's compared to that. So I'm trying to, to let that out because I feel like that's not a fair reason to call the performance bad. Okay, You have to take away the fact that it was Gene Wilder killed that role, and it was just like no one can beat... Gene Wilder playing Willy Wonka, I think, right? We all can agree on no. that. So he, he he was up against the wall anyway. That said, if Gene Wilder had never done it before, do you still really think it's the worst performance? Because, I, yeah, he's doing an impression of Michael Jackson. Yeah, I personally do, because also think about who you would want to hang out with at a party. Do you want to hang out with the guy who's like, oh, he's just kind of mopey, but he's just in the corner by himself? Or do you want that annoying guy who's trying to be the life of the party, like what he was, and he just completely missed the mark? Again, the movie Transcendence did not rely on Johnny Depp. He just had to sit there and be a computer. You could have done a screenshot of Johnny Depp and made most of that movie. Exactly. What, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory relied on Johnny Depp, and he failed. He failed, but he tried. Which one made the most money? 
probably Willy Wonka. Wonka right? Probably Willy Wonka. Willy Wonka probably, so, yeah. all right, uh, we need to make onto the speed run. I need to call the winner. Uh, here's where I'm stuck. I, I, I still feel like, I don't know, am I crazy? Do you, I feel like the Gene Wilderness is what makes people so upset about that performance, where I feel like he did. I mean, in Tonto, your argument is right. He put a dead bird in his head and he goes, blah, 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 blah. And then in yours, I've seen it, he does nothing. Nothing. Whereas at least in, in that, whether we liked it or not, he did something. No. But he did something terrible. He did something yeah, awful. That's the didn't worst do performance. Anything in these two. No. Listen, when I'd you, rather when have you have do to... nothing than be well, terrible. I, I, I'd rather have you again. be at sea level than below so, sea level. My point being, I'm taking out Willy Wonka because I'm trying to find some arguments he, they've said. He said, and I'm struggling between these two because he really did. He's he not said, white. He put on yeah. a dead bird. And he said, and, he, <laughs> and he said he wanted to transcend the original show. And all he did was did an impression of the original but, show. But you agreed with me on that decision. At least he tried something. <laughs> I don't Tonto. think no, no, he tried. Some, I don't something. think he tried. He, he, Tonto, oh, he, right walked, he sleepwalked to that. Like, he was just but like, oh, what would Tonto really, from the TV show? He Jason, really sleepwalked. Go Transcendent. home and watch Transcendence. And <laughs> no, I will not watch Transcendence. I will go home and watch Lones of Dove. <laughs> so, based on that sort of breakdown of like, he tried, I think, you, which is your main argument. I heard it. I got it. Dan gets the point. Ah. Which, Dan. You always get pouty. You always say it's against you. You are now tied. See, this entire show so has been against shut me. Shut up. <laughs> Damn pout card. Quit complaining. <laughs> so now it's tied between Dan and Mark into our speed round. Holy moly. Wow. Right. Okay. So anything can happen. I am not a, there's no ever a pre predetermined winner. So if I hear you guys say it, I might actually start making the decision to, to kill you. <laughs> uh, the game is fair. This got All interesting. Right. Speed round. It's tie up. The belt is on the line. It's a title belt. We got to get through this. Are we ready for some fast music? Right. <laughs> Again. <laughs> Man. Lowest point is automatically out. That means it's you, Jason, sadly, yep. but it was a good effort That's today. Fine. You'll yep. be back. You'll have another shot. You rode that go. horse proudly, Mr. Yes, Dove. I did. Into the lonesome dove. You can win five <laughs> points in this round. We're looking for fast answers. If you both say the same answer, Jason, Miss Movies, help me. Whoever okay. said it first gets the answer. Mm -hmm. Make sense? Yep. Uh, if you both say different answers, you're going to get a quick follow-up. Quick. I may try one question, but it's going to be based on that. Any questions? Mark's a faster talker than I am. I'm no. Nervous. Oh. I'm nervous. <laughs> Here we go. Round one. Laugh Guy, a.k.a. Disney Marvel fan, asks, The worst film starring Adam Sandler Oh, is uh, uh, Jack and Jill. Oh, boy. Yeah, it's Jack and Jill. <laughs> <laughs> I can't even make an argument against that. Thank you for being honest. I'm going to Spencer was... Gilbert that one. Just, just give me that one. Yeah. All right. Round two. Who would you save in a fire first? Ben Affleck or Matt Damon? Matt Damon. Ben Affleck. Why? Uh, because I am a fan of the DC Universe, and he is such a central figure, not just playing Batman, but he also is probably going to direct one of the Justice League films. I think he's more important in front of and behind the camera to the future of cinema. Dan? Uh, you know, Ben Affleck's fun. He's playing Batman. I think Matt Damon is a better actor. I think he gives better performances, and I'd rather see him in 30 years still acting than Ben Affleck. You can direct a lot longer into your career you than you can. You didn't say that first, so that's why you lose. <laughs> uh, you just took Batman? That was your only reason? And he's Matthew a great director said, and an actor. He's not up for directing Justice League. I don't think that's going to happen. He's, he's totally dead. Why do you think he's not on to play Batman? Is that, well, I, don't, I don't know. I think you focus too much on Batman. i got to say something. Dan, <laughs> Batman, he is the better actor of the two. I think we both agree that. But Matt Batman is the better director mm -hmm. of the two. Mm -hmm. Dan gets the point. Well, We're tied again. Has Matt Damon ever directed anything? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's like saying uh, All right. Lance Armstrong's the Round biker three. between me and Round him. three. These two movies are both playing on cable. You have to choose one. Mm -hmm. Which do you watch? Mean Girls or Clueless? Clueless. Clueless. Dan said it first. So it, that counts. Yes? Oh, jeez. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jeez. Oh. What if the answer is Mean Girls? <laughs> I, I agree. They <laughs> both said it, so it's <laughs> These two movies are also both on cable. Oh. Which do you choose? The Last Airbender or After Earth? After, After Earth. Earth. You said After Earth first, so you get the point. Holy moly, it's come down to the tie Ooh, the last all question. Right. I hope it involves The Last Airbender again. <laughs> Hollywood's best Kevin. Kevin Costner. Spacey. Why? 
I think that Kevin Spacey is, uh, is still relevant. He's amazing in House of Cards. He also, uh, you know, has a great filmography. He's got a great, he's got a couple of Oscars, and I'm excited to see what he does going in the future. I can go back to the Affleck argument. However, Kevin Costner is not only a great actor; he's also a great director. He did films like Dances with Wolves. He also starred as Robin Hood. He's in the best sports movies of all time: Field of Dreams and Bull Durham. And he's had a longer career than Kevin Spacey. Everything you said is way too old. Dan wins! <laughs> <laughs> wow! Wow! Dan has kept the bell. Yeah. I did not think that would happen. Ooh. Ooh. With, with, with his anti-old right argument. Through. I had the belt right there. Oh, so God. close. And I, to be fair to Kevin Costner, Ooh. I'm a huge Kevin Costner fan, but I really want to see House of Cards, and I feel like Kevin yeah. Spacey's just on a roll right oh now. Oh, my who God. Would've, who would have thought that Batman lost you the game? I know. <laughs> I know. That's incredible to me. Now, if he had made Batman already, and then we loved it, you would have won that debate, but I don't have even seen it yet. Mm. <laughs> we'll revisit this next so, year. So, wow. We're going to time. Going Dan, to sleep. Dan was worried. Oh. And was a jig, you, you pulled it through at the end. You told that belt proud. Yeah, yeah man. Change. You are Still you can change. change. <laughs> that is everybody can change. <laughs> so Dan is still the reoccurring champion. No one has taken him uh, off nope. the throne yet. I don't know if we want to take a break next week. You might yes, want please. it. Yes, please. <laughs> next time you're back, hopefully we'll put the belt back on the line. Thank you all for coming. I want to thank uh, Jason Inman at Jawin. Oh. Hashtag, lo plug. hashtag Lonesome Dove. <laughs> Get it trending so Robert Duvall's confused. <laughs> yep. uh, next to him, Mark Ellis at 5150Ellis. Yes, on you Twitter. can follow me on Twitter, 5150Ellis, and Instagram. And make sure you guys subscribe to me and Christian Harloff's YouTube channel, Schmoes. No, you never pay to see a bad movie again, whether it stars Kevin Costner or Kevin Spacey. Make sure you subscribe we to the Schmoes No YouTube fully. channel. And then next to him, the still, oh my God. still undefeated champion, uh, yeah. Mr. Dan Merle at Merle Dan. At Merle Dan on Twitter, hashtag Botanicus, hashtag Jared. Wow. It's and then thanks to our fan cam today. Miss Movie, did you have fun? I did. Thanks for having me. Was this crazy to watch me. in person? <laughs> it was definitely great. <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank you for your fact checking. And please check her out at Miss Movies on Twitter. That's right. Uh, hopefully we'll have you back. And obviously thanks to myself. Please go check me out on Twitter and Instagram. <laughs> it's both the same things at Andy Signor. Tell us what you want to see. Uh, I love doing this. I love hearing your comments. Also, thanks to Popcorn Talk Network. Obviously, if you don't watch those shows, what do they have on that channel? You know the best. Well, we have a DC movie news channel. Hey. Where you can catch all the latest on Ben Affleck <laughs> as Batman. Nice. Marvel movie news. Meet the movie press. Guilty movie pleasures. Jedi Alliance. So many great shows. Profiles with Malone and Mance, which just recently hit number one on iTunes yes, in TV and film. I think we only hit number four or five. What is wrong with you people? Why are you <laughs> downloading us more on iTunes? So download us on iTunes so we can beat profiles. No, oh, we love, yeah. we love <laughs> both profiles. And rate and comment, too. <laughs> yes. Do all that good stuff. Uh, and check out YouTube.com slash Popcorn Talk Network. Thank you so much. We'll see you next week. Have a fantastic uh, Sunday. Every podcast we put on YouTube comes with this kick-ass graphic, listing all the topics your favorite Screen Junkies podcasters are talking about. If you click the topics, you can skip around and choose your own podcast battle royale. Go ahead, try them all. If you haven't already, subscribe to Screen Junkies on YouTube to join us for future fights. Or if you prefer to listen on iTunes, click the logo to download an audio version. Lastly, please support our friends at the Popcorn Talk Network for more awesome shows.